ferromagnetic domains so iron nickel cobalt are very good examples of ferromagnetic materials so these materials do not have a magnetization unless they are kept in an external magnetic field but according to which theory it should have some internal magnetization so this is due to the quantum exchange of energy inside the material so according to this hypothesis a single crystal of a ferromagnetic material is divided into large number of small areas called as domains large number of small areas called as domains so in each domain the spontaneous magnetization is 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 in different direction so the net magnetization is zero so after this ferromagnetic material after this ferromagnetic material is placed in an external magnetic field the magnetization occurs because of two process one is due to the so magnetization occurs due to two process one is due to the movement of domain boundary and the other one is due to the rotation of the domain so initially before placing the ferromagnetic material in in an external magnetic field these domain areas will have a specific area and in each area or in each domain the spontaneous magnetization is in different direction so they don't have magnetization before placing it in the magnetic field so now after placing the ferromagnetic material in the magnetic field these domain walls or these are called as domain walls or domain boundaries the boundary can you see the boundary this is what is called the domain boundary so after placing this in an external magnetic field this domain boundary starts to move that is the area of the domain boundary increases for example here it is 4 and the area of the domain boundary increases so it is due to weaker field when the field is initially given given there occurs rotation of domain walls sorry the movement of domain walls so after increasing the magnetic field all these domains domain area will increase and this area will become big now there will be no domain areas and all the magnetic dipole movements will be aligned parallel to the direction of the field or along the direction of the field so now the magnetization takes place so this is what is called domain theory of ferromagnetism so what happens that is initially before placing the magnet uh, ferromagnetic material in the external magnetic field it consists of large number of small areas called as domains so in each domain what happens that is the <coughs> spontaneous magnetization in each domain is it of different direction so now when the ferromagnetic material is placed in an external magnetic field these domain walls tend to move these are called as domain walls and these domain walls tend to move and now what happens when the field is increased the domain area increases that is all these domain boundaries join together and it forms a single crystal of ferromagnetic material and all the dipole movements are aligned along the direction of the magnetic field so now the material gets magnetized so this is how a ferromagnetic material gets magnetized depending upon the domain theory of ferromagnetism so there is a small evidence so how uh, there is a small evidence by which they confirmed that there is domains and domain walls present in a ferromagnetic material so let us consider a ferromagnetic material which is which is placed under a metallurgical microscope so when this ferromagnetic material is placed in a metallurgical microscope and the <coughs> and we are taking finely powdered ferromagnetic substance and we are sp spraying on the surface of the ferromagnetic material which has to be inspected so now all these colloidal form or the powder form of ferromagnetic materials will go will all go and settle on the walls or the boundaries of the domains so due to high local magnetization due to high local magnetization all these 
powders or the powdered ferromagnetic materials will go and settle at the boundaries. So now when the field is increased, now when the field is increased, when you view through the microscope, you can clearly see that these finely divided powders are the particles which tend to move, which tend to tend to move. When the field is increased, what happens? All these powders will come to one point and the entire crystal. Now it is divided into number of domains. So after increasing the field, all these powders will settle to one side and it becomes a single crystal and magnetization takes place. So this is, this is the evidence by which we can say that ferromagnetic materials have large number of small areas called as domain. So when we increase the field, the domain area is increased and the magnetization takes place. This is how a ferromagnetic material is magnetized. Hysteresis. When a ferromagnetic material is made to have a cyclic of magnetization, the variation of magnetic induction B and the applied magnetic field H can be represented by a closed loop called as hysteresis loop. For example, let us consider a ferromagnetic material and when it is made to magnetize. So this is the applied magnetic field H and this is magnetic induction B. So now when a ferromagnetic material is magnetized, that is when the field is maximum, H maximum. So now the applied field is maximum the magnetization reaches a point A. So now when the ferromagnetic material is removed or when the external magnetic field is removed, the magnetization does not completely demagnetize or it does not completely becomes zero whereas it comes to a point A. So now the magnetization is not completely demagnetized. So there occurs some residual magnetization. This is what is called retentivity. So to remove this residual magnetism, we are applying a reverse magnetic field. So this is minus H maximum. So now the magnetization does not completely becomes zero whereas it reaches a point A, B and C. Sorry. B, C and D. Now we are applying the reverse magnetic field and now we are again magnetizing the ferromagnetic material. So we are getting a loop. So now what happens? It becomes zero. It becomes zero and it goes to H magnetic H maximum maximum again it is magnetized. So now we are getting a closed loop. This loop is called as hysteresis loop. Here this portion is called as retentivity, that is the residual magnetism which is present inside the ferromagnetic material, and this is the corrotivity. There is that is this area is called retentivity and this area is called corrotivity. So depending upon the area of the hysteresis loop, we can say whether the magnet is a hard magnet or soft magnet. If the hysteresis area loop is less, then it is called as soft magnetic materials and if the hysteresis loop is large, they are called as hard magnetic materials. Ferry magnetic materials. Ferry magnetic materials are otherwise called as ferrites. These are special form of magnetic materials with two or more ions having transition anti-parallel to each other. Anti-parallel to each other. Because of this anti-parallel alignment of magnetic moments, they express a large amount of magnetic moment when they are placed in an external magnetic field. Here the susceptibility of the magnetic material is very very high and the susceptibility is given as chi is equal to T divided by theta plus or minus C where T is the absolute te temperature, T is the, uh, theta is the 
Curie temperature and C is Curie constant. So, above the Neel temperature, it reacts as an ordinary material. So, the susceptibility is T is equal to theta plus or minus C. Above the Neel temperature, the chi value decreases and the eddy current loss in these type of ferromagnetic material is very very less. So, if you see the structure of the ferromagnetic materials, it consists of two or more ions and it is represented as X2 plus Fe3 2 plus O4. So, this is the basic structure or the representation of a ferromagnetic material. This X2 plus may be any form of material, it, it can be Mn2 plus Ni2 plus or Fe2 plus. Suppose if this is written as Fe2 plus Fe3 2 plus O4 and this is called as ferrospherite. So instead of Fe2 plus, if it is Ni2 plus, if it is Na2 plus it is called as nickel ferret. If it is Mg, it is manganese ferret. So, depending upon this x value, the ferrites may change. So, there are two different types of ferromagnetic structures. One is regular spinel, and inverse, inverse spinel. So, all these structures, the structure of a <coughs> ferromagnetic material is a cubical structure. So, for example, first let us consider the regular spin. So, in regular spin, if the material consists of manganese, if the ion is manganese, Mg, it consists of four oxygen atoms surrounded by mag manganese in the tetragonal form. So, this forms the site A which consists of 8 octagonal structures in site A. If Fe ion, then it consists of 6 oxygen atoms around the Fe ion and this forms site B. In this site B, there are 16 octagonal structures in the unit cell. This is how a regular spinel structure, this is the regular spinel structure of an <coughs> ferromagnetic material. In case of inverse spinel structure, this site B, that is site B will be in site A and half of the site B will be occupied by site A in this material. It will be completely inverse. The site A in Regular spin will come to site B and site B in regular spin will come to site A. This is the structure of the ferromagnetic materials. So, these ferromagnetic materials has a very wide applications. So, these ferromagnetic materials have a wide application because of large magnetization produced when they are placed in an external magnetic field. So, these ferromagnetic materials are used to produce ultrasonic waves by using the principle of magnetostriction and it is used it is used in the transformers that is in audio and video transformers it is used in amplify amplifying parameters it is used in computers for data processing so these are some of the important applications of ferro ferrimagnetic materials